Hey, what's going on you guys? It's Victor from Cyborg for Life and today I'm back here at the whiteboard to talk about biomechanics after limb lengthening surgery. Now I've touched on this here and there in past videos, but today we're going to dive a little bit deeper because this is another big concern that patients have after the procedure. And so like last time, we're going to kind of divvy it up between the two you know, groups of patients. First, we're going to talk about the cosmetic stature lengthening group to get taller. And then towards the end, we're going to talk about how biomechanics affect those with a leg length discrepancy. But before I do, I just want to mention two points to kind of set the overview of our discussion. And the first is that any structural alteration to your limb length, and by default, you're going to change your biomechanics. It's going to happen. But the goal is to adapt to this change by regaining control of your center of mass. And this is essentially the point where all forces acting on your body are equivalent, okay, or balanced out. All right. And then the second point that I want to make is that biomechanics, you know, they affect everything that we do on our daily basis, okay? Things like, you know, movement through space, walking, running, jumping, agility, uh, getting on and off the bus, getting in and out of the car, getting in and out of the shower, going to the bathroom, you know, you, anything that you do that's movement through space, it is going to be affected by your biomechanics, okay? And then it's also gonna be affected by things like stationary lifting, things like squats, deadlifts, leg presses, lunges, calf raises, you name it, go down the list, and biomechanics are gonna have some sort of impact on it, okay? So that's gonna set the scene for our discussion today, and we're gonna go ahead and jump right into the cosmetic stature lengthening group. All right, so now we're going to talk about the biomechanics after cosmetic stature lengthening to get taller and how it's going to affect things like your squatting, okay? Now, let's just assume that pre-surgery, everything's fine. You have no structural abnormalities. You have really good proportions or good LBR or leg-to-body ratio, a good IR or interlimb ratio, which is the 0.8 or 0.78 or whatever it is. Uh, everything's happy-go-lucky, okay? So now what I did with this chart is that I broke it down into three different columns. I have column one, which is the length and limb segment that they did. So if they did their femurs, their tibia, or both the femurs and the tibias, or they underwent quadrilateral lengthening. In column two, we have their pre lengthening surgery squatting form. Uh, just assume that all three of these pictures are the same. I just can't draw a stick figure to save my life. <laughs> and then over here, we have the post lengthening surgery squatting form, or at least the depiction of it, and we're gonna go through that, okay? Now, let's just assume that this patient lengthened their femurs. They did bilateral femoral lengthening. They got the full eight centimeters or the 3.15 inches. And yeah, let's, let's go through this. So um, this dotted line represents the center of mass, which is the bar in your back. You're trying to balance it as you squat down to work your leg muscles. It's gonna go through the midfoot, and that's how you balance it. So there, as you, as you, this line, so everything behind the line, as your butt goes back and your knees go forward, you create these things, these levers known as moment arms, okay? And let's just say that this, this uh, lever or this moment arm behind the center of mass line is moment arm A, and then in front, we'll just call that B, okay? And there's an equation called tissue stress or muscle tension is equal to the length of the moment arm times the load. So you can kind of figure out how much load your posterior chain is taking or the muscles closer to the knee, depending on where the bar is being balanced by this equation, which is really cool, but I digress. Anyway, what happens when this person gets femur lengthening? Well, this moment arm on both sides of the center mass line is going to increase, right? So it's going to get longer back here, it's gonna get a little longer up here because naturally the person's gonna sit their butt back more because these muscles back here can take, they're more powerful, they can take more brunt of the load, right? So your glutes, your hamstrings, your quads, your lower back can handle a lot more than the muscles closer to your knees because the knee is a smaller joint than the hip, okay? So naturally, when you get femur lengthening, bilateral femur lengthening to get taller, you're gonna be at a biomechanical disadvantage, okay? It's gonna make squatting harder, all right? So that means that you're gonna get more tissue stress on your lower back, your hamstrings, your upper quad, your, your, your glutes, all of that, okay? And it's gonna be harder to hit depth, okay? But there are a few tips that you can do to kind of mitigate this. Number one is to take a wider stance. Why is that? Because when you take a wider stance, let's assume that this is your femur, okay? And then this little uh, cap tip is the, um, the uh, point here. When you rotate your femur or take a wider stance, that moment arm is shortened, right? So this is gonna come back here. So it's gonna come closer, but naturally, people are gonna to wanna to kinda of have a certain amount of tissue stress in the front. So they're gonna naturally kinda of be able to drive their knees forward a little bit more when they take a little bit wider stance, they'll be able to hit depth a lot sooner, okay? So taking a wider stance is a huge tip for people who go through quad, um, femur lengthening, okay? The next tip is to elevate your heel because when you elevate your heel, you push your tibia or your, your this, this point forward 
and that allows this point to shift forward, less stress here, okay? So elevating your heel is another way to combat this, okay? Or three, you could do a combo of both. You get some weightlifting shoes or you can you know, squat on like a little elevation, like either weight plates or they sometimes have those little wedges in the gym and you can get, take a wider stance. Okay, so those are some little tips that you can use if you're getting uh, femur lengthening, okay? But you also have to think, femur lengthening is very easy in, or much easier than tibia lengthening because it can recover better, you get more length, and it, yeah, so those, those, those points right there are a really good reason why you may wanna consider femur lengthening, but it is the most impactful in your squat. So now what about tibia lengthening? It's the least impactful in the squat, why? Well, let's talk about it. So pre limb lengthening surgery, normal person, same as this, but post, what happens? This floor to knee height has increased, right? There's a longer distance than over here, let's just assume that. So that means that this portion shifts forward more. That means when they squat down, they're gonna hit depth a lot sooner. So what does that mean? Tibia lengthening almost helps you to hit depth a lot sooner on your squat. It almost helps your squat. Because if you look at any uh, professional squatting coach or lifting coach, they're gonna tell you good squat biomechanics, shorter femur, longer tibia, or floor to knee height. Okay, straight up, that's what they'll tell you. Longer torso is also more beneficial because you can stay more upright, okay? Now, people who get tibia lengthening, you gotta know that dorsiflexion can impact things, okay? Because when you get uh, lengthening your tibia, what gets tight? Your gastroc, your soleus, all those lower uh, calf muscles. So that can impact how deep you can go as well. So that's a big, big thing. Dorsiflexion plays a role, okay? Now what about if you get both femur and tibias lengthened? You get quadrilateral lengthening. Well, it's gonna be the least impactful on your squat. Why is that? Pre-surgery, fine. Post-surgery, most likely everything, let's just, say that you, let's just say that you get both five centimeters on the femurs and five centimeters on the tibias, meaning that you, you balance out and you're neutral in terms of your, your numbers and your proportions. Well, it should be about neutral in terms of what it does to biomechanics. However, the torso is gonna, your leg to body ratio is gonna be shifted and skewed. However, it's gonna be most likely the tissue stress on your lower portion, your lower body is gonna be equivalent. Okay, guys, so as you can see, this is what cosmetic stature lengthening will do to your biomechanics and what that will do to your squat, okay, and where the tissue stress will go. So what does that mean? If you get only the femurs lengthening, you're gonna have a harder time squatting, but you can use these tips that I gave you here. If you get the tibias lengthening, you're gonna have a less hard time squatting, um, but you gotta watch out also, if you get the internal nail, what do they go through? The patellar tendon. So that puts a little bit more shearing knee stress on that knee. Also, you're gonna to wanna to probably either sit back more or hit depth and not too deep because it's gonna put more knee stress um, early on while you're recovering, okay? And then if you get both femurs and tibias done, you should be about equal in terms of tissue stress. Okay, so real quick, we're gonna talk about the biomechanics and how it's gonna impact your deadlift. So there's a few points that I wanna make here, and the first is that the bar is going to be equivalent to the center of mass line because that's the mass that you're lifting. So everything is gonna revolve around that center of mass line like before, and the bar must be in front of your knees because there's no deadlift that's behind you, and we're not gonna consider the hex bar or trap bar deadlift where you're standing in the middle of the frame. And that means that the only moment arm that's gonna be considered is the posterior one, right? Because everything is behind the center of mass line. So here is that moment arm A, or A1, and after femur lengthening, moment arm gets longer, A2 is now longer, and using that tissue stress equation that we talked about previously, that means that there's gonna be more stress on the posterior chain, your lower back, hamstrings, glutes, quads, and so on. Now, what if you get tibia lengthening? Well, if you get tibia lengthening, it's gonna increase this floor to knee height, allowing your hips to drop a little bit lower and put a little less stress on your back, okay? But if you get quadrilateral lengthening, it's gonna be most likely proportional to the pre limb lengthening surgery effect. But what can you do if you get femur lengthening? There are some biomechanical fixes that I rec recommend. The first is taking a wider stance. Like, it's, like I said, it's gonna shorten that moment arm. Something like a sumo deadlift is gonna allow you to open up your legs, use more quad drive, and get more legs involved, and thus put less stress on your back. And, or you could do something like a rack deadlift, allowing for a shorter bar path when the bar is elevated on the rungs of the rack, allowing you to still get stimulation to the muscles without having to have you know, a struggle getting super, super low. Okay, so real quick here, we're gonna talk about the biomechanics and how it's gonna impact running or sprinting. So the goal of running or sprinting is to move as fast horizontally as you can 
while staying somewhat vertical so you don't fall on your face. Um, so there's a few points here. Like I said, horizontal and vertical forces, and um, it's going to divide into vectors, okay? So you have different vectors and angles and all that physics fun stuff. So let's just say this person's sprinting here, and there's some, there's some angles here, right? So um, the angle of the knee to the foot and the foot out here. So that kind of makes like a triangle. Um, and that's going to give you like a vector of, of usually a, a good sprinter is going to have about a 45 degree angle uh, lean here. And then the, um, the torso is in line with the femur and the shin. So let's just say that that's about 45 degrees as well. So what happens when this person gets limb lengthening done? What does that do to the vectors? Well, that's going to shift everything, right? So if this person gets femur lengthening, the hips are going to come higher. The knee's going to go closer to the ground. So that's going to change this angle a little bit making it, you know, if I drew it right, it would be a little bit of a, more of a shallow angle, meaning that their feet would be closer to the ground. So they'd naturally have to kind of pull back a little bit or lift their legs a little bit, their, their foot a little higher to prevent tripping on their feet and falling on their face. So that could affect their overall speed um, if they did just femur lengthening. Um, and that kind of goes to the proprioception, knowing their body awareness. So they would have to really kind of retrain themselves and get used to the new body biomechanics in order to have an effective running gait or sprinting gait, okay? And then finally, muscle control. So usually when you get your running gait down and you've got that down, that rhythm down, but you realize that you're a little slower, then it comes to muscle control. Muscles move the limbs. They move your structure forward and whatever direction you want to go. So strengthening your muscles, making them more powerful and explosive is the next goal. So really it comes down to these three things, really being aware of your, your horizontal and vertical forces, uh, your proprioceptions, knowing your body awareness in movement, you know, uh, and then finally muscle control, making sure you have good muscle contractions to be able to make sure that you can move fast enough to, you know, get back to your previous speed. All right, finally, we're going to talk about the biomechanics and how it affects a patient with a leg length discrepancy. So I was going to draw stick figures, but it would have turned out really bad because one, I can't draw, and two, uh, having a discrepancy is a very complicated subject. So I decided against it. But anyway, just know that pre-surgery, having a discrepancy is an atrocity. There's a lot of forces going in every different direction, and um, there's unequal loading of the center of mass, usually to the taller side, causing what I call a cascading chain of pain through your ankles, your knees, your hips, your back, and your neck. And um, yeah, all these joints get all kinds of irritation and problems. And the goal of a limb, limb lengthening surgery for a discrepancy is to balance out your hip height, because that's where most of the load of your body weight is distributed, okay? And if you fix that, usually you fix all problems above that and some of the ones below it as well. Now, what about unequal knee height? So let's say that you have a three inch, or I'm sorry, three centimeter discrepancy on your right side. Two centimeters in your tibia and a centimeter in your femur. But you only want to get lengthening done in one limb, you know, so you can save time, cost, and recovery. Let's say that you get it all done in your tibia. That now means that you have overshot your discrepancy by one centimeter in terms of knee height by the end. Your hips are balanced. You've solved that problem. So you've achieved the goal of the limb lengthening surgery for the discrepancy. However, your knee height is not balanced because you lengthened it all in the tibia. You didn't do it perfectly balanced. So the limbs themselves are not perfectly balanced, okay? What does that do? Well, usually for everyday activities, you know, like walking, you know, things like that, and low impact activities, it's not gonna do anything. But if you're a high level athlete, or if you do heavy squats and deep knee bend activities like leg presses and lunges and things like that, you might notice in a little bit more shearing force going through that taller uh, knee, knee height, okay? Because that floored knee height is a little bit taller on one side. How can you kind of work around this? Usually taking a wider stance and, um, you know, will help offset the shearing force going through that knee joint. That's what I found has helped, and doing unilateral training will definitely help, okay? That's what we have to deal with, uh, with the discrepancy. Really, it's gonna kind of live with us, unless you wanna kind of, you know, do both limbs and um, equal out the limbs themselves, okay? But that's all I really wanted to kind of talk about for discrepancy because a lot of the other uh, factors that we talked about for cosmetic stature lengthening will apply here because you will gain some height from a discrepancy fix. But, um, but yeah, it's a very complicated subject and you really need to realize that uh, you will have some you know, lasting repercussions if you live with your discrepancy lar long enough and if it was large enough. But a lot of these pain symptoms will resolve themselves after you get your hip height balance, okay? All right, guys, that's all I have on biomechanics and how it affects you, the patients who get it done for cosmetic stature lengthening and leg length discrepancy. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, go ahead and hit that like button. Be sure to subscribe. And until next time, this is Victor from Cyborg for Life, signing out. Peace.